what happens when you have an identity crisis? You're going through life, everything's chuffing along nicely, and you're feeling pretty good. Then all of a sudden you wake up and it's like, hmm, what am I going to do now? How do you go through this process? Some call it a midlife crisis. How can we do that in a mindful way? How can we find ourselves and get back on this journey to enjoying our life? Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care, and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to the Shared.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, Valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own interest to help others. And today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Billy La. Now, Billy is the creator and host of the Mindful Midlife Crisis podcast. It's for people navigating the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. And Billy's goal is to help people better understand how we can enjoy and make the most of our life we have to live in a more meaningful way. Welcome, Billy. Hey, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. It's a great pleasure. I love the work that you're doing and, and how you're getting out there and helping people. It's um, it's a lot of really great benefits from that, including getting the hit, the give as high as it's called. We need to promote that a bit more as well. It's, it's certainly cheaper than drugs and much, much better <laughs> lasting. Yeah, you know, I I pride myself on being the hype man. I you know, if people who follow me on Facebook a lot and like lately I've been doing a lot of self promotion because I'm like, please listen to my podcast. But before that, I would have a lot of friends who were in bands. I was very uh, <laughs> clued into the uh, were you groupie? To, well, to the I was very very tied into the local music scene in Minneapolis, yeah. Minnesota, where I'm from. And I would just promote my friends' bands, just say, hey, mm -hmm. this band is playing on Saturday. Who wants to come with me? That sort of thing. And yeah, I, for me, it, I, I just like promoting things that I think will bring happiness and joy to other people's lives. Now, maybe that's running under the assumption that I know what will bring other people <laughs> happiness and joy, which which I own. It's a presupposition uh, there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, no, 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 you're going to enjoy this. But one of my favorite compliments that I've ever received came from my good friend, Mike Callowitz, and he said, Billy, what I like about you is that when you're excited about something, you want everybody else around you to be excited about it, too. And that was really meaningful to me because mm. I felt seen, I felt recognized that, you know, hey, the reason why I am such a spaz and I'm so intense and <laughs> people are going to be wondering, why this guy is here to talk about mindfulness. Why is he like this? Well, I practice mm. mindfulness because that way I can maintain this level of, of obno obnoxious. I can maintain this level of intensity <laughs> because if I didn't practice mindfulness, I would just be an out of control asshole. So that's, that's why <laughs> I practice mindfulness, but I know how the impact has had on me. So I'm always excited to share my experiences with mindfulness because it really has had a life-changing revolution for me. And I know that it can have that for other people as well. I love that. I think that's probably something I needed to um to learn when I was younger. So I wasn't such an obnoxious ass when I was younger. 
<laughs> but speaking of being younger, let's um let's jump in the Wayback Machine. Now you'll probably remember this machine. It's a it's a silver coloured DeLorean that Doc Brown invented. And when you hit eighty eight miles an hour, you can travel through time. So let's jump in that. Hit eighty eight miles an hour. Go back in time to some some period in your life where you know you, you've had some challenges to overcome, some struggles, and the way that you've you've worked through those that led you to do what you're doing now. Do you want to, do you want to take us back in time and through that experience? Yeah. It's a, my childhood was great. Like I didn't, I did not experience much trauma. I, I didn't go through a lot of challenges through my childhood. I think for me, the biggest crises in my life when I was younger <laughs> crises that I that I made up in my mind. I'm, a, I'm an <laughs> active thinker. I'm an overthinker. I even say that on the podcast when I introduce myself. And, and I think that overthinking over time kind of manifested into this feeling of, of anxiety. I didn't have tools in order to slow down the thoughts. And then when you mix in things like feeling rather entitled to just kind of being, you know, doing whatever I want, that sort of thing, uh, you know, I, I think that led to some really emotionally immature behaviors once I hit my 20s. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very much a social person, love being around people. What I found, though, was that I was never myself. I was always doing impressions or I was you know, I would I would act like somebody that I saw on TV or if there was somebody that I had met previously and I thought they were funny and they got they got a lot of attention for the way they behaved, I would take on those behavioral qualities. So I was really going through this identity crisis of who am I and what 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 am I? That sort of thing. Yeah. So in my 20s, everything's centered around good times and being the center of attention and getting drunk. So, and, and, and I think most... I relate to this. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who can relate to that, right? And I just never invested in emotional maturity. I never invested in personal growth. Now, professional growth... That was important to me. But if you're not investing in your personal growth, then you're not making the same gains professionally. Now, I worked in education. So I think that there was just kind of this, this linear progression as you, and, and there was repetition because it was sort of the same classes that I was teaching year after year after year. I just got a little bit better in those classes as uh, as the years went on but i didn't get better as a uh, in terms of regulating my emotions in the terms of of how i managed situations and a lot of it became projections onto others like well i'm right and you're wrong and i think that kind of goes back to this idea of knowing thinking that i know what's best for everybody yeah so and so I, I, you know, I kind of I struggled with that a little bit when I was. In I've, my I've never done that, and I've never experienced anyone doing yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm all by myself on this. I'm an I'm a man on an island here. Have you ever been on social media? <laughs> well, and, you know, I'll tell you that I, I'm really working on my social media content, but in terms of and how much I consume, whew, that's another story. Yeah. But uh, but isn't it isn't it a place where I mean I'm, I'm digressing there, but I just have to put that in there to, as a tag for later. That it seems to be that is the attitude in social media. I'm right and you're wrong, and there's very little listening in there. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that's maybe that's why I'm drawn to it because it's like no, I want to get my ideas out there. But I think as now that I'm older, mm. now that I'm older. I realize that I'm not right about everything. Whereas when I was 25, I was a hundred percent right about everything. Yeah. And you couldn't tell me anything. I wasn't yeah. going to listen to what people had to say. Mm. So 
and I like that just kind of goes back to being that obnoxious asshole, right? But because then I would project it outwards and I yep. would say things to people that people were like, oh, I can't believe you said that, then I would get attention. But yeah. I was getting the wrong attention in that. Mm. And when I say that I wasn't investing in my emotional growth, what I was investing in was getting drunk. And it's not that I was an alcoholic, but mm. I had Carrie Schwer on my podcast. It's episode 61. She's a gray area drinking expert. Mm. And she, which, what she means by gray area is that you're not an alcoholic, but mm. your drinking is interfering with your ability to, to grow in some way. Your drinking is getting in the way in, mm. in some capacity. And that's what was happening with me. I was going out two or three nights during the work week, waking up, feeling like shit the next day. And then on the mm. weekend, getting blackout drunk. Yeah. So, so that was my life for seven years. From 23 yeah. to 30, that's just how I, how I managed things. Mm. And I remember, you know, one of the people that was really close to me when I was 25, who was kind of part of this group, where I would go out every weekend, he died in a car accident and his personality was larger than life. So then mm. I felt the need to take on his personality and be larger than life to fill that void mm -hmm. right, that that was missing in, in my life. So again, yeah. it just kind of goes back to this identity piece of trying to figure myself out. Fast forward now to my thirties and there was all this emotional Re, you know, residue that I that I had to sift through that I that I hadn't at that time, and mm -hmm. I went through a really bad breakup with a woman who, in my opinion, was emotionally abusive and was manipulative. And because I'm a people pleaser, which I didn't realize until last year, this was a mm -hmm. new awareness because somebody brought it to my attention. I was easily manipulated. By yeah. by her. Now that's my side of the story. She might have another side of the story, but <laughs> I felt like she it was an emotionally abusive relationship. I was easily manipulated by her, and it left me broken, absolutely mm. broken. And then there was a, another failed relationship that was in there. That one lasted a year, and then all of a sudden she was she was a single mom, and she decided that she didn't want to change the dynamic between her and her son by introducing someone new into the mix. And so mm -hmm. I felt rejected there. And I was also feeling rejected in the workplace because where I was working, I was teaching at-risk students. I was teaching at an alternative program. And those mm. students were coming to me with a lot of social, emotional, academic, behavioral barriers to learning. And I just wasn't, like I said, I wasn't emotionally mature enough to work with students like that, yeah. I wasn't the right fit. I wasn't the pillar of support because, you know, I, I wasn't a pillar of support for myself. My foundation was cracked. Mm. And then what rock bottom for me was I, I was dating somebody who she was a perfect 10 in every way. But I was projecting all of my insecurities and my inferiority, inferior, uh, inferiorities and all my inadequacies onto her. Mm. And uh, just out of the blue one day, she said, you know, I don't, I don't like the way that, that you treat me. So I'm going to go. And I was like, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it. Like we had never had a conversation about it. And yeah. he just dropped that bomb on me. And I was like, well, well no, 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 I can change. She's like, I've I've turned the light switch off, so I'm done. I'm out. Mm. And yeah. that just destroyed me. And all that stuff that had been bubbling up leading in up to that point started to manifest itself into anxiety attacks and mm -hmm. then into depression and, and then into suicidal ideation. And Ooh. my absolute rock bottom was around February of 2013, I was sitting on my couch and I was going to go to a friend's birthday party. And it was a Saturday night. And I said, okay, I'm going to leave around seven. I'll get to the party around seven 30. 
And for whatever reason, I still remember the time. It was 6.51 p.m. And I started having this anxiety attack. And for me, an anxiety attack feels like a boa constrictor wrapping around my stomach mm. and then just making its way up to my chest. And I start crinkling my hands and I start scrunching my shoulders. I start hiking up my shoulders. It's difficult for me to breathe. My mind starts racing. And it is just, it was exhausting to mm -hmm. the point where when I finally kind of came out of it, even though it wasn't any more intense than any other anxiety attack that I had, I texted my friend and I said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not feeling well, so I'm not going to make it to the party tonight. Sorry. And when I woke up the next day, I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? It's the weekend. Normally, I feel like this on Sunday nights. The anxiety kicks in so badly because it's going to be five days until I get to the, the next respite from this hellhole of a job that I have. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that, okay, I think I probably need some help. And I've been using my best friend as a pseudotherapist because he has his PhD in neuropsychology. So I was you know, just kind of offloading some stuff onto him. But that's not really fair to your friends is because they mm. got they're not professionals and they're not getting paid to to listen to that, especially at the level of intensity that I was struggling with my mental health. So mm -hmm. he said, dude, you need to go and speak to a therapist. And yeah. luckily for me, right around the corner was a therapy office. And I looked up all the therapists on there and I sent them. Or excuse me, I sent him their CVs and, and their information from the website. And I said, you know me best. Pick the person you think is going to be able to get me emotionally well. And so he picked a woman named Mindy Ben Dixon. And mm -hmm. we started doing therapy twice a month. And we did that for six months. And she's the one who introduced me to mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And I she would give me these little exercises to do outside of therapy. And so mm -hmm. I started incorporating some of these mindfulness techniques like name and tame, where you, you, you or recognize the emotion that's bubbling up and you name it and you say, oh, this is fear. This is loneliness. You're feeling mm -hmm. lonely. Not I am lonely, but you are feeling lonely. And just helping me recognize that these emotions were like visitors because they would come and go that they weren't permanent residents in, in, in doing that, then I was able to kind of see them for what they were and welcome them to an extent and then say, all right, we've spent enough time together. Now off you go. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. Instead of shutting the door on them and saying, don't come in, don't come in because then they're banging down the door trying to get in. As we, mm. as we look at the metaphor. So then when summer, summer break rolled around, I started ramping up my mindfulness practice because I figured, well, if some mindfulness is good and I'm feeling a little bit better than more <laughs> must be even better. Right. And so I, I started doing about 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon and 10 minutes in the evening on a fairly regular basis. And yeah. when the school year rolled in, I had this morning routine that we can talk about a little bit later, but Mm -hmm. That morning routine really helped me kind of set the tone for the rest of the day. And I remember in October, one of my sophomores, who I also had as a, as a freshman, said to me, Mr. Lar, you seem like you're in a better mood this year. And that was <laughs> it. That was the selling point because it was just like, oh, my goodness, this is so palpable mm -hmm. that my students are feeling the shift in my energy that my yeah. students are feeling the shift in my mood. Mm -hmm. And so then when, when I recognized that, of course, I was excited about it. So what do I do when I'm excited about things? I want to <laughs> share it with everybody. So I started learning more about mindfulness, and I started taking courses about mindfulness and understanding more of it. And then I, got, uh, I completed my Mindful Educator Essentials program for mindful schools so that I could mm -hmm. lead mindfulness in my classroom. Mm -hmm. and I've been going around and doing speaking engagements about mindfulness locally in, in the state of Minnesota. And now I'm in the process of getting my mindful teacher certification from mm -hmm. uh, mindful ex mindfulness exercises. And I'm, 
I, I've been leading virtual mindfulness sessions with people in Seoul because I'm in Tokyo right now, and I, I've spent a lot of time in Seoul, and we can come back to that too. But and now I just started doing mindfulness sessions with people in in the states virtually, mm. and you know I know you're based in Australia, and that that. Australia is only an hour ahead of where I am in Tokyo and when I'm in Seoul. So mm -hmm. if you have listeners who are interested and you're like, I kind of like the cut of this guy's jib right here. I, I, I want to get involved in this mindfulness. Reach out to me because I'd be excited to share it with you because I often see mindfulness not only changed my life, it most likely saved it. Because I was looking for a, a far more permanent solution mm. to my problems when I was experiencing so much anxiety and depression, I just wanted it to go away. And mm. interestingly, one of the only things that, that kind of saved me was my anxiety to some degree, because I have so much FOMO, fear of missing out, that mm. if I had something to look forward to, then there was always like, well, I don't want to miss that. I, I can't, I can't kill myself because if I do, then I'm not going to be able to do this thing. I'm not going to be able to go to this concert. I'm not going to be able to hang out with this friend. So mm. that FOMO, oddly, is what kept me alive. Mm. And and then when I started practicing mindfulness, then I was able to to alleviate the 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 intensity of these anxiety attacks. It's not to say that they went away, mm. but I would be standing up in front of the classroom talking about Romeo and Juliet, and then I would start experiencing this anxiety attack. And when I would have the anxiety attack, it would start in my stomach. So mm. when I would feel that, I would say, oh, this is the beginnings of an anxiety attack. Yeah. All right, now that you're aware of that, Let's just kind of keep it where it is. We're not going to suppress it, but let's just keep it where it is right here. We're going to think of it like a thermostat. We're just going to keep it right here. And we're not going to let it bubble up and get into our chest and then get into our brain. And now that you're aware of it, kids are going to be kids. Someone's going to do something ridiculous in class, but you now are aware that you are in this anxious mindset. So... Mm -hmm respond as opposed to react and do not project your anxiety onto them. And then I would finish my lesson. I would get them working on something and then I would go to my desk and then I would do some breathing exercises in order to alleviate some of that pressure that was building up. And mm -hmm. that's how I was able to recognize and mitigate this anxiety that I was feeling. And I'm able to do that now, too, and almost maybe to a, a, a fault because I find myself overthinking and overanalyzing and struggling with decision fatigue, that kind of thing. But I, I view my anxiety as sort of a superpower because what it does is it, it, it moves me. It, it, can, it can cause procrastination and it can stall me out, but it also gives me an opportunity to process everything so that I can respond better as opposed to impulsively react, which is always, which had always been my default was to impulsively react. And I need to unmute myself and it, because I, the audience, I had a bit of a cough and a frog in my throat and I muted myself and then didn't unmute myself and I started talking. Um, but that's pretty powerful stuff you've talked about there. I do want to acknowledge, um, you know, from the perspective and, and I think it's important to, to point out for anyone that listening that might be, you know, having suicidal thoughts or things along those regards, please, please reach out to somebody. You are not alone. There are people out there to help. There's professional organizations. Um, as much as you may feel that you're alone, please reach out to people um, because you'll find that um, I, I use the analogy uh, from Crocodile Dunn. D, the movie Crocodile Dundee, where they're talking about a psychiatrist and she asks, well, you probably don't have a psychiatrist at Walkabout Creek um, to unload your problems to. And he goes, no, no, we, we just have Wally. If we have a problem, we tell Wally. Wally tells everybody else, then there's no more problem. <laughs> 
So please use that as an analogy. If you are, you know, having those thoughts or feeling alone and, and, you know, reach out to somebody um, and you'll be surprised the connection that you make. So, so please do that. I do want to really quickly, just, just to kind of, I'm going to therapy now and I'm quote unquote living the dream because I'm traveling around the world, but Mm. navigating this midlife transition that I'm going through right now, the first year that I was doing this, I wasn't working with anybody and I had a lot of thoughts that I needed to process and I was, I was spinning my wheels, so to speak. And Mm. now that I am working with somebody, it's incredible my ability to process through things. So mm. it's not just that it's not just we should seek out help when we're low. We absolutely should. Mm. But then continuing on too, because we we develop that, we just continue sharpening the saw, so to speak. If mm-hmm. we if we're going through things like, like talk therapy. Or even if we're doing mindfulness, if things aren't super intense, mindfulness Mm. is kind of a low intensity way to manage that anxiety. And talk therapy is another layer on top of that. And I really want to stress this for men. Mm. We we have been conditioned to, you know, shove down emotion and not express emotion. And it's so crucial that, that we do share what's going on with ourselves in some capacity because if we don't we're just this powder keg ready to explode i was telling you before and i I just kind of want to share this here i was doing a meditation right before i got on the show here Mm. and this very intense feeling came up for me during the meditation and this doesn't happen, this, this actually hasn't happened, I think, in a few years. But this very intense emotion came up for me to the point where I just started bawling. Started bawling mm. during the meditation. But it was clear that I needed that. I needed that mm. release. I needed mm. some way of, of letting that go. And I'm not ashamed to talk about that. Yeah, and I think it's important that that we have outlets, and that we're we have ways of managing stress, and that part of being manly, Mm. quote unquote, part of being manly, is to be able to do it in a way that that gives us an opportunity to respond to situations and not react uh, based on ego. Mm. And some sometimes, yes, it, it it does require us to to go into this macho mode. And there's nothing wrong with this masculinity. There's nothing mm. wrong with masculinity. Mm. I talked to talk to Pradeep Sangha, that's episode 67, and he talks about we need to create more mindful alpha males. And I just mm-hmm. love that concept of mindful alpha males. <laughs> and and I think I, I think the way to do that is to be able to be open and honest about our emotions. The most mindful alpha male that I can think of is the character Macduff in the play Macbeth. Because mm-hmm. after his, his wife and children are slain by Macbeth's henchmen, he's, he's weeping. He's weeping, mm-hmm. understandably. And Malcolm is kind of trying to recruit him to say, let's go and get revenge on this guy. And he's processing all the emotion of it. And Mm -hmm. Malcolm says, dispute it like a man. And Macduff responds with, I shall, but first I must feel it like a man. Mm -hmm. Meaning he's there weeping. He is showing his emotion. And so the first thing he's going to do is he's going to expend, he's going to share, he's going to get out all of that emotion Mm -hmm. because he's feeling it so intensely. He's not going to make an emotional response. Mm -hmm. He's going to get it all out. And then he is going to 
exact his revenge. Yeah. And that to me is a mindful alpha male because mm-hmm. he's, he, you know, and I, I'm not saying that you need to go and, and cut off the heads of all the people who wrong you. Right. The, mm-hmm. What I'm saying is, is that when you are wronged, and it's hopefully in a lesser capacity than having your wife and children slain. But if you are wronged in some way, it, go ahead and experience the emotion that goes along with being wronged. Go ahead and experience the emotion of disappointment. Go ahead and experience the emotion that that you are that you're feeling. But then, mm-hmm. once you've processed through it, once you've allowed that space between the stimulus and response, then you are able to act or excuse me, move forward accordingly. You're able to so, move forward with the best course of action. So on that that topic of where you when you are wronged, I want to bring that back to some of the stuff that you mentioned earlier, where you talked about you know feeling rejected. And I want to link that to you know where people you know get offended, so to speak. Well, not to directly speak. You know, people go, oh, you've offended me. And you know, you're linking this, you mentioned before that you felt rejected. It, how much of that, when you look back at that now, because you, when you talk about the, the girl that you dated and then she said, I don't want this anymore and I've, I'm walking away. And from your perspective, again, that feeling of rejected, how much of that do you think is your own feeling as opposed to the other person you know, offending you or doing something. I mean, you know, because when we look at that, especially when we look at being in a free country, um, you, you, you know, your background, I'm certainly you know, from Australia where we have a free country, freedom of speech, that kind of thing. And do you think we take things now too personally where we, we're getting offended and we're using that as a basis to control other people? It's like, well, you know, how dare you leave me because, you know, I- I'm hurt by that. Or how dare you say that because I'm offended by that. Um, how much of that do you think is on our own self to go, well, that's my feeling. And I'm, I'm drawing a lot. I mean, my, my scholarship is a lot of study with, uh, of Wayne Dyer where he talks about it's your own inner candle flame. If you want to, you know, it's like a volleyball, playing volleyball match. Someone says, oh, you should have done this. It's them hitting you the volleyball. You can take that volleyball, smear it all over yourself and go, how dare you say this to me? Or you can go back and say, well, you're clearly upset. How much of that is our own control of our own feelings as opposed to what the other person has done? I do think it's gaslighting to say well, that's a you problem. That's not a me problem. If I were to say something to you and you were to say, oh, I don't, I don't like how, I, I don't like what, what you said right there. That offends me. And then if my response is, well, that's a you problem. That's not a me problem. Mm-hmm. If I were to say something that were to offend you and you were to say, I'm offended by that, I think my response would be, oh, t- tell me more. What's mm-hmm. your experience? So mm-hmm. that I understand why something like that. Well, why shouldn't the person that says they're offended say, tell me more before they get offended? Because I want the feedback. I want the feedback. Yeah, no, no, but I'm that putting that as a, 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 a global way of interacting with each other from that side of thing. It said that you, you've said something to someone and, and I would assume that you, if you say something to someone, it's done with good intention. Um, that's the underlying principle. You know, knowing you briefly, uh, you, you seem to have you know those good intentions. I want to understand this dynamic here. And so, if you say something with good intention, that person takes it as offense. Why isn't the responsibility for them to say, "Well, hang on, before I get offended, I'm going to exercise some mindfulness, take a step back, and try and understand what their intention is." And I think it can. I think they can. Right. Yeah. But it's not on that person to educate someone else. Mm-hmm. So if, mm. if it's not the other person's responsibility to teach you why that something might be offensive, it should be the other. Well, that's I feel a like presumption it's, that it is offensive. Maybe the, that's what I'm saying. If, they're, it, if they're acknowledging, if they're saying, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe you shouldn't say that. Mm-hmm. And, because I mean, and, there's a lot of stuff out there at the moment where you could say it's you know it's not offensive. It's just you know being. <laughs> the person and going, I think 
I think it becomes more of a dialogue, right? Mm. And so, and so it becomes more of a curiosity. One of the things that we talk about in mindfulness is mm -hmm. being more curious. So, mm -hmm. asking the question, oh, well, uh, I, I don't. Well, that's that's the point I, that I'm I, getting. I, to. I never, yeah. I never thought I would have never thought that that was offensive. So, help me understand why you think that is offensive. And then the person can share their point of view, and then being open to it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily saying that you're going to agree with it, but being yeah. open to it and hearing okay. that person out and saying, okay, I, I see mm -hmm. your point and I respectfully disagree. And here's my take on it. Here's the way mm -hmm. I see it too. And I, th mm -hmm. I think that's what we're missing. We go back to social media. Mm -hmm. That kind of discourse is missing because yeah. it just becomes impulsive and it becomes reactive. Yeah. I don't yeah. think that it's that it's necessarily the other person's responsibility to educate the other person as to why they think it's defensive. Mm. But I, I think it, it, if the other person is curious and they want to know, well, wait a minute, why why do you think that that's offensive? Rather than saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not offensive. It's like, well, okay, I'm curious. Tell me a little mm. bit more because if I am good intentioned, which by the way, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> if, if I, if, if I am good intentioned, I want to know well, why did that have such an impact on mm -hmm. you? And then they can mm -hmm. share that other person, if they want, they can share the, the impact of it. They can share their mm -hmm. experience, that sort of thing. So I think that level of discourse is missing. Cause I mean, because the reason we're I'm instant. Yeah, the reason I'm asking that question is because, I mean, I deal with uh, um, one of the programs I have is uh, negotiation magic, and we have very high level corporate negotiation skills taught in that. Um, and I know from my experience working in that space of negotiation and, and dealing with that, a lot of the time um, you, you're actually dealing with people that don't have the skill. They might think they have the skill, but they don't have the skill to do it. They don't have the emotional maturity to be able to do that. Um, and they don't understand that they're lacking that. So this is where I want to understand that dynamic. Of, and we talked in the, the pre-show, one of my only resolutions this year was to listen more um, because of that. And it, it's amazing how much power that gives you when you listen. So I'm just wondering from that decourse here, the discourse, sorry, that you have with people, you're having a discussion and someone goes, oh, I'm offended. Um, but, you know, from my experience, a lot of the times when someone does that, it's a skill thing where they're not aware of that what they're doing is an emotional response. It's a very low level response. It can be an attacking response, which again is a low level response. Um, and, and so this is where I was wondering from that dynamic, as you, as you said, in response to that, if you're in that position, you're operating from a mindful perspective going, okay, well, tell me more. Um, so that's, you know, how you're addressing that. But I just wanted to, to cover that off because I find that there's a lot of that out there where, you know, someone, when we, we mentioned before about that, you know, you mentioned before the road of <laughs> to hell is paved with good intentions. There's a, there's a, a lot of that out there. And I wanted, what I really wanted to get back to was this part where you were talking earlier on about how you had this relationship and, and you felt, um, I've got it, you felt rejected. And I relay that to an experience I had when I was in the army. There was a, a guy that was in the, I was in the army with, and he, he was, he was, he was a good looking guy, but he wasn't very bright. <laughs> He was always dating these really amazing women. They were great looking. They were highly intelligent. They were kind, you know, lawyers, doctors, you know, great giving people. And myself and my friends looking, going, how, how, <laughs> how are you doing? This? You're not that bright. And I actually did go up and ask him. And I said, and I literally said this to him, I said, Stain, you're not that bright. How is it you're dating all these great women? And he looked at me and he, he turned to this wise Obi-Wan character and he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Damien, what you don't see is I ask a lot. Most of them say no. You just see the ones that say yes. And I want to put that in the context of you, you talking about from your perspective, and, and I'm relaying this to from my own experience too, where you know, I'd ask people out and, and they would say no and feel rejected. 
Stane clearly didn't. He didn't care. He just moved on to the next person. How much of that when we're talking about mindfulness is going through that process of realizing it doesn't matter what the other people do. It's what you do and how you interpret, how you choose to interpret what's happening. You are talking to a people-pleasing perfectionist. So (laughs) for me, rejection is really difficult. It's mm. really difficult. Mm. So when when you talk about, you know, in, in this change, one thing that I had to get better at was receiving feedback. Mm. And rather than saying, it's not my problem, it's your problem. Yeah. Getting that feedback and being able to say, okay, how how am I processing this feedback? Yeah. One thing that I would do, one thing that I would do with my students that later on uh, was that at the end of the year, I would give them like this obnoxious 35 question survey (laughs) and give them an opportunity to evaluate. (laughs) And, you know, most teachers give them like a five question. No, I'm a, I love spreadsheets. I love data. I could look at (laughs) spreadsheets and data all day. So, you know, I wanted to give them an opportunity mm-hmm. to evaluate on a on a lot of different levels, not mm-hmm. just not just how was I at teaching, but how was mm-hmm. I at relating to you? How was I at communicating with you? That mm-hmm. sort of thing. What sort of you know, connection did we have? Did you feel connected mm-hmm. to me? Did you feel connected to the class? How did I create an atmosphere of safety and learning? And mm-hmm. and 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 risk taking that sort of thing and th- they were brutal they were brutal mm-hmm. because again these were students that were coming in with social emotional academic barriers to mm-hmm. their learning and th- so they weren't super keen on school in the first place and i wasn't the best fit for them i mean mm-hmm. i i have this level of intensity mm-hmm. so it almost i, I almost kind of have this this military approach to you sound like you self sabotage yourself in the exactly feedback that you knew it was gonna hurt you. <laughs> yeah. But but in reading that feedback, mm. my initial response was, well that's a you problem. You were a shithead mm. in my class all year long. <laughs> but then when I would go back and I would read through it the next day, mm-hmm. then I would say, okay. Let's think about the experience that this student had right here. Yeah. And yes, they were a shithead in your class. And they mm-hmm. weren't in this other person's class. Mm-hmm. They were actually a different student in this class. Mm-hmm. So is that a me problem yeah. or is that a them problem? And yeah, it probably was a mixture yeah. of both. It, pro- it, was, it was a mixture of both. Mm-hmm. And the, the reality is, is you're not going to get along with everybody. There are just mm-hmm. some people who you're going to to gel with. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't my, so to speak, community. Like mm-hmm. we, it, but the interesting thing is we would do these, I would have them as ninth and 10th graders and mm-hmm. they were, they would exit out the program and go into 11th and 12th grade. And so one of the assignments I would have them do is I would have them do this graduation speech from our program. Yeah. And a lot of those students who gave me the most grief Mm -hmm. spent the most time talking about how I never gave up on them. Talked Mm. about how, how Mr. Law, you're so annoying and you are so strict (laughs) and you are so hard. Thank you for being that for me because it was everything that I needed. And those students primarily male or female. Both and Both. and okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it was just kind of it was interesting. I was just curious from that perspective of of men generally needing a little bit more structure, a bit more rigidity. Um, and and again, I would that's a stereotypical I, response, but it's yeah. I would say that 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 the female students were more receptive to like being re- reflective and saying, you know what, when I look back on these two years. I realized mm-hmm. that you, you were hard on me because you, you wanted good things for me. 
And the, mm-hmm. I think the, I think teenage boys still have some ego involved with it. But the reality is I'm still working with teenage boys. So mm-hmm. did I ever evolve to to be able to work better with the the teenage boy ego? I don't know mm-hmm. that I did. And so that's feedback for me as I look mm-hmm. back on it. Now, mm-hmm. I left education in 2021 and then because I did it for 21 years. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I want to move on to something else. Mm-hmm. But having those tough conversations with mm-hmm. students in the last six years that I was uh, working in education, I was a dean of students. You're always the bad guy when you're the dean of students. Nobody likes the dean of students. They make movies it's about not your job like to be me. liked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You make they make movies about me, and and I'm always the bad guy, right? Mm. I'm always delivering bad news. As a people pleaser, I didn't like delivering bad news. I didn't like mm. giving students consequences, but they all mm. thought that I did, and mm. it's, so then you become public enemy number one. Mm-hmm. And that was really, that was another thing that just kind of challenged me and burned me out. Mm. But at the same time, if they were upset with me or if parents were upset with me and they gave me, even if they were yelling and yelling and yelling, I would take that and I would process that with my associate principal, who I had a a fantastic relationship. And I would Mm -hmm. say, here's what this person said. Obviously, they're mm-hmm. saying it out of anger, and I'm taking it very personally right now. Mm-hmm. So help me process through this, process through this. And she would say, you can dismiss this 85% right here, but here's take this 15% and let's grow mm-hmm. from this because mm-hmm. this might be valid feedback. And she and, and and that would be kind of the growing moment for me. And so this idea of getting feedback. Mm. I think we're so intent on being right mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and solid in our opinion that we don't allow room for openness and, and curiosity. And so mm-hmm. that's, I try to encourage people with that. One of my favorite quotes comes from Walt Whitman, and it says, mm-hmm. do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. To mm. me, that's how we should be living our lives, is that yeah. we should be contradicting ourselves all of the time because what that's saying is, is that we are open to other understandings and other experiences around in the world. We don't have to agree with them necessarily, but we are open to understanding their experience and, mm. and, and taking feedback and saying, huh, that's an interesting perspective. Now that I have that new acquired information, I can Mm. use that in some way to help me reflect, learn, and grow. Yeah. Wow. From that side of things, because you discovered mindfulness, um, which you credit to saving your life, if I've heard that correctly. Um, And there's a lot of talk about finding that quiet space. And and I personally relate to that as well. I do what I call now gumping um i've got a at my beach house i've got a a large very large lawn which i used to have a gardener for and i bought myself a self-propelled lawnmower not a ride-on but you walk behind it and i go out and i go up and down sometimes it doesn't even need mowing but i just need that space and i don't listen to you know music or anything like that and i just have the electric mower is kind of cool has a nice little hum to it which is really you know i find quite therapeutic how you know from that perspective how do we, you know, how does someone get into, you know, mindfulness? Is there a set process that you need to do, or can you just do what I do, gump, you know, walk up and down the, the lawn with a with a mower in front of you? I mean, how, how do we do this? And and what are what are the actual? Is there, you know, any health benefits as well? I mean, obviously mental health benefits, but physical health benefits. Yeah, so it's interesting that you talk about mowing the lawn there because. When we talk about intensive mindfulness practice, mm-hmm. usually we're we're talking about meditation. So mm-hmm. that's kind of your most intensive form. And you might be thinking, yeah. well, I've tried meditation. It doesn't work. I just can't do it. And I always say, listen, if you're trying it, it means that you're doing it right. So we can always <laughs> get better at it, right? It, yeah. it, to me, meditating is a lot like learning a new skill. 
if you're learning mm-hmm. a new instrument or if you're going to the gym, right? Especially if we equate it to going to the gym. Mm-hmm. Over time, you are building muscle. You are gaining strength. You're able to add mm-hmm. on weight. And then you're able mm-hmm. to do more things. Well, with mindfulness, yeah, your 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 focused attention might only be five, 10 seconds. Yeah. But if we continue on with the practice, you can get to a minute. You can get mm. to two minutes. And really, you're just focusing on your breath. Your breath is one of the most neglected pieces of your body because you don't ever you don't ever think about it. It's because mm-hmm. it's so automatic, but it's everywhere that you go. So a lot of times yeah. with meditation, we just use our breath as an anchor. And in a sense, mm-hmm. we just watch our breath. We're just yeah. with our breath. And what's going to happen is the mind is going to drift off. And that because that's what minds do. That's what the brain does. It wants to think. It wants to take mm-hmm. you to the past. It wants to take you to the future. It's time traveling all, all over. Mm-hmm. So then the, the awareness, the practice is actually in the failure. It's yeah. when you recognize, oh, I'm not focused on my breath anymore. So now, now that I know mm-hmm. where my brain went, I am without judgment, without saying, oh, I screwed this up. But compassionately bring your attention back to your breath and saying, okay, then I'm going to focus on my inhale again. I'm going to focus on my exhale. And that's a really easy way to start. It's not, it's, it's complex in that the brain is complex, but it's a simple practice, but in that simplicity is complexity. So I've been Mm -hmm. leading these virtual mindfulness sessions lately Mm -hmm. and just helping people kind of get into the, the, the basics of mindfulness where we focus on our breath, but then we turn our attention to maybe sounds in the room or sounds mm. around us, or mm. we intentionally bring an emotion in. And that emotion might be something that elicits joy and mm-hmm. then turning, tuning people into where they might feel that emotion within the body. Mm. Right. And that's kind of what happened with me prior to this is that I was doing my meditation. And as I was listening to the guided meditation, he was saying something to the effect of you maybe if there's if there's thoughts that are coming in with intensity let those mm-hmm. thoughts come and i did i just it, it, it was kind of like a faucet where i turned it a little bit and then mm. i was feeling it and then when i was given that permission to just let the intensity come ooh, the floodgates open for me yeah. and it's interesting that you talk about mowing the lawn because there is mindful movement. We we do mm-hmm. mindful walks. We do mindful eating. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the things that I would do in my morning routine to start my day off a bit more mindfully was mm-hmm. I used to have this clairsonic. And so if you don't know what a clairsonic is, it's basically this exfoliating vibrating brush that you can use in the shower and you can wash your face with it. And yeah. my girl, my ex-girlfriend at the time, she used to, uh, she used to work in cosmetics. She used to do hair. So she would get all these deals on these beauty mm. products And I would see her <laughs> washing her face with this thing. And I'm like, what's that? Can you score me one of those? So <laughs> I got one and it, it was a vibrating brush that lasted a minute. And what I would do mm. is I would take that brush and I would put it on my forehead, start it. And I just say forehead, mm. right temple, mm. right jaw chin Mm. and i would wash my face but i would mark where the brush was on my face just Mm. for that one minute and just Mm. be with the brush for that one minute and the reason why i would do that is because as someone who i'm a morning person so as soon as i wake up my mind is racing with the eight million things that i need to do and all the people that i need to tend to and all all the assignments i need to correct So Mm. when I would hop in the shower, that was a way of slowing down those thoughts. Mm. And it was, it, it, it just started off the rest of my morning routine because then I was able to slow down my morning in a way where it became methodical. Then I would go and I would do my morning mobility routine. 
And then I would go get dressed. And then I would take the dog out. And then I would take my, I would drink a huge glass of water and I would take my vitamins. And then I would take the dog and she and I would lie in bed and I would do my 10 minute med- morning meditation. And mm-hmm. then on the way to work, I had, I, I did this practice where instead of flipping through my iPod, looking for the perfect song, I got 8,000 songs on my iPod. Whatever came on, came on. Whatever shuffled mm-hmm. through, I listened to that song. And then to kind of top it off as sort of a memory exercise, I would write down the the commute playlist on my board mm-hmm. to try and remember what songs I had listened to on mm-hmm. that commute so that I was delaying gratification of I got to find the perfect song and mm-hmm. just being present with whatever the song was and some songs were absolutely ridiculous do i have Mm -hmm. thong song by cisco on my ipod i sure do do i have Mm -hmm. safety dance by men without hats yes ridiculous songs but they make me laugh so then (laughs) i'd be like oh okay this i i like this but then it would get mixed in with things like rage against machine or pearl jam that sort of thing Mm -hmm. and so there was just kind of this this eclectic musical uh, uh, shuffling that would go on that had I just flipped through, I would ignore all of these mm. songs. So instead, there was this process and it was intentional to just simply be present with whatever played. Yeah. And the easiest way to bring us back to the to the present moment is simply to recognize where do we feel our breath? And most of us feel our breath either in our stomach, on the inhale and the exhale, and the rise and fall of our chest, or we Mm -hmm. feel it through our nose. So Mm -hmm. we can be present with our breath in an extremely intense meeting. The -hmm. number of times that I've had to slow down even during this conversation Mm -hmm. has allowed me to you know, reframe and just be, especially when you're talking, then it's like, okay, this is, this is kind of be present with your breath, be Mm -hmm. intentional with your listening. Mm -hmm. And that slows things down because I know as soon as I start talking again, things are going to ramp up. So then Mm -hmm. I need to slow myself back down after a while. And then it allows me to, again, be a bit more thoughtful in my responses Mm -hmm. so that, so that I'm 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 clear with my communication. I'm choosing my words carefully, mindfully to overuse the word, so that people can can connect with what I'm saying. Yeah. How do we? I mean, for someone when we're talking about you know slowing down, you know, when, when you, you're talking with someone and what you're talking about, let, let's take someone who's who's struggling to get everything done in their day. They just don't have enough time in the day. And then you're talking about adding one, you know, something extra to do. Let's do some meditation. And also to slowing down. How do you, how, where, where is the benefit to that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So John Kabat-Zinn is kind of the godfather of mindfulness research. You and, want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and his, Go his, to the take, is, his take is that, if you look at mindfulness as one more thing to add to your to-do list, don't mm. do it. Don't yeah. do it. What I did is I took a time inventory. Mm-hmm. How am I spending my morning? To me, the mm-hmm. first 90 minutes of your morning are the most crucial 90 minutes of your day because it yeah. sets the tone for the rest of your day. So I mm-hmm. looked at the first 90 minutes of my day and where were the time leaks? A lot of times the time leaks came in the form of checking my phone or Mm -hmm. just lollygagging or not, you know, choosing my outfit. Could I choose Mm -hmm. my outfit the night before and lay that out? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's one less decision I need to make in the morning. I'm someone who Mm -hmm. struggles with decision fatigue. So it's one less decision I had to make in my morning. Mm -hmm. And what happens is if, if you're like, you're like, I don't have time for mindfulness. Great. Do you have time to look at your morning routine and automate it? Because if Mm -hmm. you can automate it, then what you might find 
is that, oh, this actually doesn't take as long as I thought. Maybe I do have time for a five minute meditation to just sit with my breath for five minutes. Mm. Even that alone might help because what I would do in the afternoon, I, I would do lunch duty. And then after lunch duty, I would go back to my classroom mm -hmm. and I would do a meditation, usually about 10 minutes. So I would lock my door, lie on the floor, and I would do a 10 minute meditation. And after that, I felt so much better and I felt energized, mm -hmm. ready to tackle the, the, the second half of the day. You know, people have their afternoon tea or whatever, or their afternoon coffee. I don't drink coffee. So doing that 10 minute mindfulness practice in the afternoon was a, a, a jolt of energy for me. Mm -hmm. What I found was when I, I went and said, I don't have time for to do my meditation practice. Mm -hmm. Then, then I was completely wiped out and I didn't mm -hmm. get done all the things that I wanted to do. But on the days where I was like, I don't have time for my meditation practice. I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Way more productive and way yeah. more efficient to the point where mm -hmm. I was like, this is going to take me an hour to get done. No, I was more focused and I was able to get it done in 45 minutes. So, yeah. so that is to say that if you're looking at it and thinking to yourself, this is one more thing that I need to add to my day. No, mm -hmm. then don't, don't look at it as something that you get to do and do that time inventory in the morning or in the afternoon. Maybe it's not, maybe you don't, you legit don't have time in the morning to do it. Mm. But if you commute and if you're in a car, maybe taking three minutes in your car to simply be present with your breath before you get out of the car and you walk into the chaos of whatever work is. Maybe you get to the office and you close the door three minutes and you just simply be present with your breath and start it off with a little more quiet with a little bit more intention around those mm -hmm. things. You don't have to meditate for 10, 15, 20 minutes. A little bit of mindfulness will go a long way. And then what you may start to recognize is that, oh, I'm operating at a far more efficient level. Mm -hmm. And now, if, and, and you might have the same revelation that I had where you say, well, if a little is good, maybe a little bit more is better. <laughs> and you actually set aside time in your mm -hmm. day to do these kinds of things. Yeah. So I think I think people can find ways to put it in there. But if the idea of adding it stresses them out, that is the opposite impact that we want mm -hmm. to have. But I love looking at people's how people spend their time. And mm. I had a guy on my show named Greg Scheiman. Greg Scheiman, episode 41. He's fantastic. I love Greg Scheiman. Mm -hmm. And his his saying is show me your calendar and I will show you your priorities. And <laughs> I just love that because it's very true. So if we do that time analysis and say, here's what you're here's how much time you're spending doing this, this, and this. Is there a way where we can make this more efficient? And then if so, what do you want to do with that time where mm -hmm. you can actually be a, a bit more intentional with, with something where you can put yeah. a focus on something? And again, I would use my commute as a mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. So even though I, you know, my attention was on the road, mm -hmm. there still was a, a, you know, there was that transition of, okay, now there's this song and what, what, what emotional impact is this song having on me? Oh, I hate this song. Or, oh, this reminds me of this concert. And then just kind of mm. being present with that feeling while still doing the automatic uh, of driving. If you're yeah. on the subway, it's even easier to do that on the subway. I mean, mm. if, especially if you're looking for a reason to not talk to the people sitting next to you on the <laughs> subway, just being present finding finding a meditation yeah <laughs> finding a meditation that you can listen to on the subway in your earbuds mm -hmm. and just being present in that way you don't have to sit on some meditation pillow and you don't have to go to bali in order to meditate you can do that on a subway you can do that so, on a bus 
to coin an analogy, it sounds like what you're talking about there, mindfulness is like is like that story of the two people that are chopping wood and one keeps stopping and keeps stopping throughout the day. But at the end of the day, the person that stopped has more wood chopped. And the other person says, how did you do that? I mean, you kept stopping. He goes, well, I wasn't stopping. I was sharpening my axe. And you know, from that perspective, it sounds like mindfulness, when you look at it from that perspective, um, you know, you're you're looking at how to sharpen your axe, how to be more efficient with your day. And, and I know from that perspective with people's days, a program called Max Time and the Pareto principle applies there. 80% of what most people do in the day is not relevant or necessary to achieving what they want with this, the presupposition there that they know what they want. But, you know, when so there is so much time in the day. But what you're talking about sounds like fits within that category of, you know, mindfulness helps you be better at what you're doing so you're actually much more efficient at what you're doing. Um, with that, you I mean, your focus, you talk about midlife crisis and, and mindfulness in that space. You want to talk about the midlife crisis. Is it, is it a reality? Is it a myth? Or, or what is this process? How does midlife crisis come about? Is it a case where we just need a sports car and we have to get out there and get one? Or what is this midlife crisis process? <laughs> yeah. So we actually covered this in our first episode. Now, I'll tell people now, if you're going back and you're listening to episode one, and do me a favor and listen to whatever the most recent episode is, because the quality of the show has significantly <laughs> improved over the course of those two years. So <laughs> please, please don't That's listen to episode point. one and, and, and be like, these guys suck because we got better. We definitely the show definitely got better. But if you if you want to kind of do this deep dive on what the, the midlife crisis is, we take a look at some research. Now, you're asking me to really dig deep into the research here, we we were reading through some research that Dr. David Blanchflower has mm. done. And what he was found is that people in that mid-age, so probably around between 35 and 55, right around there, 40 to 55, mm. they would report that they felt less satisfaction in their life at that mm. at that time. So where is that coming from? A lot of that is coming from taking a look at what you thought you were going to accomplish when you were younger mm -hmm. and then seeing where you are at this mm -hmm. stage in your life and asking yourself, am I satisfied with this? Mm -hmm. And so then the impending crisis comes from not being able to, in my opinion, the appending crisis comes from a, a lack of gratitude, not being able to recognize what what you have accomplished in your life. And maybe mm -hmm. you haven't accomplished all of those things. So then are you in complacent zone? I have no problem with comfort zones. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm tired of people villainizing comfort zones. We spend a lot of time trying to get comfortable in our lives. <laughs> so now you're telling me that once I finally reach my comfort zone, that you want me to get out of it again. Can I just have a couple minutes, maybe, maybe <laughs> a couple years to enjoy this comfort zone. Mm -hmm. That's, I just want people to stop villainizing it. What I want them to do is reframe it and say, get mm -hmm. out of your complacent zone. And yeah. so I think what happens is when people start having families and mm -hmm other people become dependent on them is that they start, they, they do start people pleasing and they start uh, sacrificing mm -hmm. the things that made them happy in order to allow others to allow their children, allow their partner to, to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Now, I can say that easily because I'm not married. I don't have kids, right? So, mm -hmm. so maybe there are people out there who are like, well, no proof of purchase from you, dude. How would you know? Agreed. So then why don't you go and talk to your friends who are married and who have children but are not experiencing this existential crisis? Instead, they're experiencing this, this pivot they are experiencing this renaissance in midlife mm. where they are now seeing that, okay, 
I have a few more options available to me because mm. I've taken the skills that I've acquired over time. I've taken my strengths. I'm more aware of those. Mm. I've taken the feedback that I've gathered over time. And now I'm going to apply this to towards something that gives me purpose at this stage in my life. Because most likely your career that you started off in is a, is a result of what you of what you were interested in when you mm. were 20, 25 years old, because you, you pursued whatever career you had that you majored in, right? Mm. And I'm very cautious to not use the word passion because I think this idea of follow your dreams and follow your passion is absolute rubbish. Mm. I think it is terrible advice, terrible, terrible advice. Instead, we should be telling people, follow your strengths and follow your curiosities because passion is a byproduct of following your strengths and following your curiosities mm -hmm. instead. Because what I was interested in at 20 and 25 years old, I'm that was my passion back then. I'm not so interested in those things anymore. Over time, <laughs> those things have shifted. But you know what mm -hmm. hasn't shifted over time? My strengths. My strengths haven't shifted. They've only gotten better. Mm -hmm. If I have chosen to sharpen the saw to use your story right there. Yeah. Now, my curiosities have changed, so I mm. can pursue my curiosities mm -hmm. with these newly sharpened strengths. Mm. So when we talk about the midlife crisis, I think it really relates to people who have entered a complacent zone mm -hmm. and don't have an understanding of what their strengths are, have, don't have any new curiosities. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not exploring, they're not open mm -hmm. to, to new opportunities and not, not because they've, they've shut the door, but they just, they're unaware of it, right? Yeah. That goes back to awareness as well. Mm -hmm. And then in turn, you, they, they, they hit this spot where they're like, well, this is just my life now. Well, it doesn't have to be, dude. You can, you can still evolve. You can mm -hmm. teach an old dog new tricks. You can mm -hmm. still evolve and 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 really enjoy this second half of life because from 35 to 55, that's 20 years where you you're you're taking care of yourself. You get to mm -hmm. call the shots for the most part. Yes, you have other responsibilities if you're married and you have children, mm -hmm. but but you get to call the shots. Whereas for the you know when you were younger, the first 25 years of your life, you were kind of dependent for the first 18 years of that. Mm. And between 25 to 35, you were an idiot because you didn't ha <laughs> have enough life experience for the most part. Mm. Most people don't. You didn't have enough life experience. And you were, you were still experimenting with mm. how to, how best to live your life. I mean, that's kind of yeah. how I look at between ages of 20 and 35, trying to figure myself out. And because mm. I was so emotionally immature, it, it took me longer than it takes most people. Yeah. So when you finally hit 35, then you have this realization that, oh, okay. Like now I, now I have the emotionally maturity. I have the awareness. And I, for a lot of people, I have the financial resources mm -hmm. in order to shift whatever my purpose is at this point. And mm. now I can kind of pursue something that feels a bit more meaningful. How am I going to do that? I need to get curious and I need to understand my, my strengths. And if you don't know what your strengths are, ask the people around you and they'll tell you what mm. your strengths are. Interestingly cool. enough, most divorces that are initiated um, after the age of either 50 or 55, I think it's 60% of divorces that are initiated after the age of 50 or 55 are initiated by women. Why mm. is that the case? Well, what they, what they think is that women hit this post-menopausal zest. And what happens is they've been the caretakers for so long. Even if it's a, mm. a home where, where both people are working, the, I guess the research shows here that women still are uh, it responsible for the overwhelming majority of the the housework and the care that goes on with the children, right? Mm -hmm. So 
when the children are out of the house and they're empty nesters, a lot of these women are like, peace out. I'm going to go live my <laughs> life now because I feel this postmenopausal zest and mm. I'm, I'm taken up. So it's not mm. necessarily the men who are trading in their wives for the sports car and the 20 year old. It's the women who are saying who are trading in their husbands for purpose. Mm, interesting. We're getting short of time here now as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about you know the services you offer and how people can contact you? We'll put some of the details in the show notes. But do you want to explain you know what is the the work that you're doing, how and how people can reach you? Yeah. So if if you've listened to this and you're like, okay, I, I kind of like what this guy has to offer. I like his intensity. So now I'd like to see what a mindfulness practice is like with this dude. <laughs> You can go to www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com and at the top banner, you can join our Mindful Midlife community. You don't have to be in midlife. In fact, if you're 20 years old, you're 25 years old, join our Mindful Midlife community and listen to some of the stories that people are sharing in there and mm. join our mindfulness community because we're doing virtual mindfulness sessions and in, in doing so, it just kind of gives people this opportunity to be able to learn how to be more mindful, to open their mind to curiosity, to awareness, to compassion, to sit with difficult emotions rather than mm. going to the phone and trying to push them away in some way through through re, you know, reinforcement or, or some sort of affirmation. So yeah. www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com. All of our episodes are there too. If you are curious, well, what are some of these meditations like? You can go to our YouTube page, just search for mm -hmm. Mindful Midlife Crisis Podcast. The episodes are there. If you like watching the YouTube episodes, I also have meditations there that you can follow along with. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Most people listen to it on Apple Podcasts or they listen to it on Spotify. But if you go to the website, we have a fan faves list. So mm. if you go under podcast and you go to fan faves, there's a list of probably about 20 or 25 episodes that the fans mm. have said, these are our favorite episodes. So we've added that in case you're like, where do I start? Where do I start? Start there. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram. I post a lot of stuff about mindfulness, but since I'm traveling around, I've been traveling since September of 2021. I've been to Portugal, Spain, Mexico, Korea, Thailand, Singapore, Vietnam, and Japan. And I'm going back to Seoul here. So, and I love talking about travel. I like helping people plan their travels, that sort of thing. So if you're curious, whoa, where has this dude all been? And, and what has he all checked out? You can follow me on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. You can email me at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com. I love interacting with people. I'm always curious who hears these episodes and have they had any impact? And is there anything that I've said today that resonated with you? And if so, let's connect because I'm a big believer that the world is better when we connect with others. And I'm a big believer that sharing our stories connects us. So I hope that my story here today resonated with people, and I hope that it's an invitation for you to connect with me because I'd love to connect with you. I love that. Really love that. Um, Billy, before we go, and I, and I did give you a bit of a warning about this question, but if you were to, to leave the audience with your key wisdom or key takeaway, what would that be? That it's okay to sit with your emotions mm -hmm. and that whatever you're experiencing is normal mm -hmm. and that most likely there's another person out there, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are experiencing that emotion mm -hmm. at that moment. Yeah. And to sit with that emotion and to become curious about it. Mm -hmm. And as you explore that emotion, mm -hmm. extend compassion to yourself mm -hmm. as well. Because 
when you think about self-talk and mm. I know I know people like Mel Robbins have said this before where you would never say the things that you say to yourself to your friends. So how do you then extend the compassion to yourself when you recognize that you're feeling this emotion intensely? Yeah. You know, before I, before I got on the show, like I said, I was doing this meditation and this overwhelming feeling of grief and mm. mourning washed over me as I thought mm. about my adventures traveling from country to country coming to an end. And I've made this really strong connection with people in Seoul. Mm -hmm. And when I left Seoul the first time, it wasn't as sad because mm -hmm. I knew I was going back. But now when I get to Seoul in May, I'm leaving in July and I don't know when I'm going to go back. Mm -hmm. And that is really a challenging emotion for me because mm -hmm. of the deep connections with the people that I have made there. And mm -hmm. so I'm almost going through this, this pre-morning process. Mm -hmm. And that emotion washed over me today. And I'm not saying that your emotions are going to are, are going to affect you or hit you in a way like it did with me today. Mm -hmm. But it's obvious that I needed that because I was able to to get that emotion out and move on with my day in a way that that feels healthy. It's not going to be weighing me down. So mm -hmm. sit with emotion. It might be boredom. It might be joy. If you're experiencing joy, sit with that joy. If you're experiencing confusion, sit with that confusion. Mm -hmm. Be open to it. Be curious about it. Because the more that we understand how our emotions impact us and impact the decisions that we make and where we feel those emotions in our mm -hmm. body, then the mm -hmm. more we're able to recognize, oh, this is what this feeling is. This is, this yeah. is, now I understand what's going on because I remember what, when I sat with it the last time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then it allows you to respond as opposed to react. And I feel mm -hmm. like that in turn opens up this line of communication, mm -hmm. not just with other people, but with ourselves. And we mm -hmm. become uh, uh, more self-aware in this process. Mm -hmm. I love that. Billy, it's been so wonderful having you on the show. You've got so much to sh share, so much enthusiasm, which I really, it's been exciting <laughs> listening to you. I'm sure we can have uh, many, you. many more talks. Um, there's so much that it, for, for the people to digest and, and get into, but thank you very much for being on the show. It's been wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate that you're having these conversations. So keep up the good work. Thank you for being part of the share.care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.